Okay, so I think we can we can start. And uh, I know this recording is very important because uh, you know as we decided, uh, somebody of you asked uh, in the chat. Uh, many of you are already <laughs> on Easter vacation, let's say. Okay, so today we will have three hours all together, and uh, like like in a normal lecture, in the first hour and a half more or less. We will have a look at those uh, at these slides, which are already online, as usual, on the um, course website. And we will focus in particular on um, uh, API security. So last time we decided you know, how to implement APIs with the web uh, server, deciding some URLs and some HTTP methods. And now and, and today, Okay, we will uh, have a look at uh, the security implication of all the choices that we can make. Okay, since this course is specifically focused on cybersecurity, so this is a, a, a part which is in addition uh, to to what we were doing uh, pre in previous years in other in the other course, not focused on security. Okay, just in case you had a look at the program and so on. Okay, okay, so uh, le let's start. Well, first of all, we need to uh, remember that we are designing web applications, okay? So, web applications are a particular kind of distributed applications. And where distributed application means that we have a code that runs in different places and is connected, uh, I mean, on different CPUs, on different uh, computing systems, and it is connected, so it talks using the network, okay? So there are independent programs that uh, talk to each other, okay? And this is a distributed application. And we have a special kind of distributed application, so a web application, where basically we have uh, one client or many clients, depending on you know, how, how we want to see the picture, but just one server, at least one logical server. So the place where we go and ask for uh, uh, information, for instance, as we saw last time for, for um, uh, for uh, uh, data, okay. Uh, this kind of configuration is of course complex. I mean, <laughs> uh, there's nothing in addition that we can say because we have different computing systems that can have also different architectures that can run. I mean, that actually run different programs, and they need to talk to each other in a, a secure and correct way. Okay. Um, in fact, here you can see, uh, um, I mean, uh, four of the main challenges that you encounter in distributed applications. Uh, this is a, uh, this is a quite general list, but of course, since web applications are a subset of distributed applications, this applies to us as well, so to our web application. So all data that arrives to uh, one of these computer systems uh, is um, uh, coming from an external, so it means a non-secure source, okay? So any kind of data can arrive to our applications, uh, both on the client side and, and on the server side. Typically, the problem is more related to server side because server accept requests from anybody, okay? Because it's a server by definition, it's there waiting for somebody that makes a request, okay? While well, the client is a bit less critical in this context because uh, typically uh, it works in our web application with a, a request response paradigm. So if it doesn't initiate a request, uh, it doesn't expect data, so it doesn't process data, okay? Uh, and so the first point is that we need to check and validate uh, data that comes from external sources because it's always, uh, uh, it, it can always come from sources where we uh, that we don't expect and with the format that we don't expect so uh, it will be um, you know one of the main issues that we encounter in our web application so writing a, a, a good server that um, I mean can process and can refuse uh, requests which are not uh, 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 valid uh, and that can potentially cause problems, okay? Of course, uh, uh, that's the issue of permissions. 
before performing operations, we need to make sure that uh, uh, the, um, the one that requests the operation has the permission to do the operation. Okay? We cannot just uh, take a, a request that says, well, delete some data and just delete it. Okay? We need to check who is requesting the, this operation and if it has the permission to do that. Okay? So you want to change the example, you can make a, a lot of, it, of examples like this. I mean, you would like to have your, um, you know, your mark for the exam registered. Of course, I mean, some, somebody on, this, on the server of the Polytechnic will need to check who is requesting to register, you know, uh, add your vote for the exam. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and then there are other let's say le uh, less obvious uh, uh, issues that we might encounter but they're actually quite uh, concrete i mean we uh, they happen quite a lot especially especially in in large applications like uh, uh, synchronization issues okay so it means that we have programs ar running on different uh, computing systems uh, and uh, we need to have a, a way to synchronize the, 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 the operation. So one must wait for the other that performs an operation and then get the answer and wait for the answer and so on. Okay? Because they are completely independent. They are two computing systems completely separate. So one can be fast, the other can be slow and vice versa. Or maybe during the communication something can happen. Like here, you see, consider that communications may fail. Okay? So I send a request, I will never get an answer. For any reason, I don't know. Then the network, the local network uh, connecting my client to the Wi-Fi system is not working. Or in the uh, network uh, connecting the client and the server, that's a problem. That's a problem. Also, a problem that is not always present. So some connections, some requests will not arrive at the server. Or, and some will arrive, okay, and they reply as well. So we need to take into account these problems, okay, which are the typical problems of, of distributed applications. So in a certain sense, we are not, uh, I mean, uh, inventing anything really new, okay. So we can follow, let's say, the ideas already developed uh, to to create good uh, distributed applications, but we will uh, um, focus them especially in our uh, situation where we have uh, a client server architecture so there's somebody the client that uh, initiates a request and a server that is typically there just to wait for requests and provide answers to those requests okay okay before uh, continuing um i invite you to visit this uh, website where we can click and see yeah if it works okay this is a very useful website, well, well done, well maintained, okay? Uh, OW, uh, WASP, OWASP, okay? Open Worldwide Application Security Project, okay? Not really uh, uh, focused exclusively on web application, but I mean, uh, a good share of what you find here is about web application and web application security. So if you are in doubt and you would like to have uh, some guidelines uh, or advice and so on, go to this place, <laughs> uh, go to this site in the first place, okay? Um, and uh, we will, uh, in short, uh, see a summary of many of the things that are listed here on, the, on this website which is basically a place where all security experts collect uh, advice and review advice on how to uh, create uh, uh, secure web applications in, in the best possible way, okay? Some advice is obvious, something is less obvious, and it, it typically gets updated quite uh, frequently, okay? It's not a, a website that lists, uh, you know, bugs and vulnerabilities that then get patched and so on. It's more about concepts, okay? How to do things, how to prevent attacks and so on, okay? So it typically explains the, the problem and gives guidelines on how to avoid those problems, okay? Okay. And if you go to this website, one of the <laughs> nice figures you, you will find is uh, the one that you see here on the slide. So the top 10 of the web application security risks 
okay so top 10 problems <laughs> that uh, in terms of security that can happen in web applications okay um, there are many more of course and uh, not just 10 but I mean it's interesting to see how things uh, also evolve over time you see 2017 2021 there's no figure for something more recent but uh, um, you see that uh, things that were let's say less important uh, at a certain time let's say in 2017 access control which was not uh, configured properly or, or implemented in a way that was not suitable for for having good security now has become uh, well actually not now but in 2021 uh, has become number one risk in your web application um, and some something also you know goes down in the list like uh, uh, authentication maybe because uh, you know good frameworks come out and you know people start to use a good uh, uh, packages uh, libraries and so on which are very well maintained and so on um, easy to use etc maybe this kind of problem is reduced because if you follow the guidelines and you use good libraries uh, you solve the most of the problems okay so things uh, evolve over time as in any other uh, let's say research field um, something appears like <laughs> you know uh, items that uh, uh, you know uh, are were not in the top 10 I mean things uh, are, are typically known but maybe not not one in, in the top 10 list okay uh, we will have a look at, at uh, some of the most important things to to get right to have a, 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 a reasonably secure web application I mean absolute security doesn't exist okay uh, I mean the, the, we, we, we are we cannot prove uh, that prove that uh, a program I is perfect uh, in any sense not even that it it can compute the the result that we actually would like to have okay Th this has been proved quite a number of uh, years ago uh, and um, so uh, we we cannot uh, uh, prove that the program does what we would like to to do so uh, 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 as a consequence we cannot prove that the program I is fully secure okay uh, but I mean following uh, the guidelines uh, good guidelines uh, developed by let's say the most important and the, the 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 best security experts around the world I mean we, we achieve a good trade-off between uh, complexity of the implementation and the security of the application that we are going to develop okay um, there are different kind of problems that might arise in web application some can be uh, intercepted and mitigated so stopped uh, by some firewalls and here firewall means uh, a quite generic term it's not just you know filtering packets it is monitoring what is happening at different layers of the network stack and check if there's something going on that is typically related to unsecure behaviors of the web application okay but of course we cannot just rely on this on this kind of things on, on a web application firewall we, uh, we need to 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 focus on on uh, securing our web application uh, because the way we implement the functionalities is in, in general secure or secure enough for our purposes okay uh, there are things that we cannot really handle inside our application if you think uh, you know uh, somebody is flooding you with a lot of packets I mean you um, so it's flooding typically the server with a lot of packets I mean you cannot really do anything in, in your application code just handling the request right so there, there must be something external you know to prevent this excessive flooding okay but now here in this course we will focus on what we can do uh, in the web application to prevent the, the the security risks okay the most important security risks so I already told you that incoming data that needs to be processed typically by the server is always a problem okay because it comes from from the network and today it means from the internet uh, which means from any 
where in the world from anybody in the world. Okay? One common mistake about this is thinking that only the client of your web application system can send a request to the server. This is not true. Okay? This is never true. I mean, anybody can send requests and also can send requests no, not using your client application. So any data of any type can arrive to our server and we must be able to handle any kind of data, any kind of request and so on. Of course, if they are not valid for our application, the only thing we will do is reject the request so the, we don't answer or we answer saying there's an error and so on. Okay? But always keep into your mind that fact that anybody can send requests to your application. Okay? And typically when we, s when we talk about sending requests means to the server. Okay? So incoming data must be carefully checked every, every time for, you know, at least, uh, you know, these three main uh, uh, potentials to create problems, so three, three main points, okay? Uh, so let's have a look just to, uh, you know, uh, have a flavor of what this security means in our web application. So first of all, data should be formally correct, okay? So we are expecting a number, it cannot be a string, okay? That's really basic, but I mean, it's uh, already a, a good check to do, okay? Or, uh, I mean, you have a, 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 a counter, I mean, negative counter probably doesn't make sense. So if, if you get a negative number, I mean, you stop the processing of the request uh, because you already know this is not a valid, uh, valid data uh, uh, for your application. And so you avoid using this value that maybe was not considered in the implementation of your application and might, ca might cause problems, okay? This is very basic stuff. Of course, it, you know, it won't stop <laughs> many problems, but at least it will stop the biggest problems, okay? So if you have an ID, an identificator of some resources and you expect it to be a, an integer number, positive number, this is a very, very simple and easy check to do. Just do it, okay? Um, <coughs> and then we need to have consistency with the, with the application logic. So uh, taking the previous example, uh, the ID that represents a certain item in your system could be like the film in your labs. For us, is in, in, in the example in the lectures are questions, answers, and so on. This identificator, um, depending on the request, of course, must refer to something which is actually existing. Okay? Of course, if we are creating something new, the identificator uh, doesn't exist, so there's no ID. And this is another check that we could do. I mean, it uh, doesn't make sense to have uh, an ID to be used in creating a new element because the ID will be computed by the server and returned to the client, uh, as you should do, uh, as you did yesterday in the lab, right? Th that's what you were supposed to do when creating something new. Um, but I I you want to update something so you want to change the title of the film, you should check that the ID refers to a film which exists, okay? That's a very basic uh, uh, example. I mean, probably it doesn't cause problem if you try to update something that doesn't exist, the SQL query will not update any row and that's fine. But there are more complex examples like uh, uh, you would like to add, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a course in your study plan, and uh, you have an ID, it is the matricula, you know, the, the six numbers of your student enrollment number, and you add a course, and what happens if you add a course which is related to an ID that doesn't exist? I mean, that course will have a student enrolled which actually doesn't exist. So that's a problem in the application's logic. It's not, that, it's not that you are creating a security problem, at least for the moment, okay? But you create a, an inconsistency problem in your application. 
And the more the data is inconsistent, the more you risk running into problems because your code encounter conditions that are not expected. You are, you know, searching for all the students uh, enrolled in a course and printing their name, okay? And you find an ID that doesn't match with any students, and so what happens to the print or, you know, the instruction that search and print the name of that student? Is that instruction able to handle the case where the ID doesn't exist in the database? I hope so. Otherwise, maybe your server crashes, okay? So it's not really that you modified or, or, or you, you, uh, st uh, st uh, you steal uh, data and so on, but you interrupted the service because you made the server crash, okay? That's another security problem for your application. Just because, you know, you inserted uh, something that uh, seemed uh, uh, to have no problem, just uh, you know, uh, inserted a, a course with a reference that doesn't exist, okay? And the problem, it doesn't happen when you insert the information. It will happen later when somebody will try to use that information, okay? So consistency with application logic. That's, that's a quite a difficult point to handle because you need to have a very clear understanding on how the application works and think about uh, wh what can happen, you know, in case that some data does not fulfill the constraint that you expect. So it's something that you expect and you should be able to, to write it down and implement in your, in your code, okay? And then there is directly the potential to create problems. So like uh, you have data that you would like to, um, you know, insert typically in your uh, database, uh, so store permanently in your, in your server. Uh, which contains uh, um, information that is supposed to be just information to store, but then instead execute some actions that you would like to avoid, okay? Like uh, the typical example is the so-called SQL injection that we will see uh, today also with a small example, just to give you a flavor of what can happen. I mean, everything is fine. Uh, I would like to insert a new film with a certain name, so last film that uh, I saw at the cinema, fine, but instead of inserting just the name of the film, I in some way change this name and add something that is not supposed to be executed, but since the, the server has some implementation issues, will be executed as an instruction for the database and creates problems, okay? This is just an example. I mean, it's not like that any um, uh, any action to insert this string will create problems because if the server is reasonably well implemented, this will not create problems, okay? But if you didn't pay enough attention on the server side when implementing things, uh, you risk having these problems, okay? Okay, this is uh, just a, a small remark. We will come back to this uh, uh, in the last part of the course. Note that this stuff also applies to authenticated request, a very, very common mistake uh, that I've seen in the past years. And uh, also it's, you know, it's, it, ca it can happen when you, when you think in, in these terms, in terms of security of the, the web application. Well, you think because the client is authenticated, okay, uh, it cannot send malicious requests. That's not true at all, okay? Authenticated client, send and will send, you know, uh, uh, malicious requests, okay? It will happen. Actually, I, I don't have statistics for this. I, I, uh, maybe I should have checked, but uh, no, many times problems come from inside the organization, not from outside the organization. So from authenticated users, okay? So all these checks uh, cannot simply be avoided because you say, well, the request is authenticated because uh, it comes with a, you know, a token or a cookie or whatever that we will talk about later in the course. And so it's a user of my system, so it's trusted. Users of your system cannot be trusted. Nobody can be trusted, okay? So this checks applies uh, all the time to any request, okay? But we will come back to this when we talk about authenticated uh, requests. But uh, it will be later in the course. That's the last topic 
it's the more complex one and we need to have all the system in place so both the client and the server to play with the authentication okay so uh, we saw how to implement the server side and uh, um, now we are designing apis and today we will uh, you know carry out uh, uh, some development of the APIs for the project uh, uh, that we see in the lectures, so question and answers and so on, and you will continue doing this stuff in the next lab for your project with the film library and so on. Uh, the next lab will be, well, there's a schedule online uh, after Easter, not th that week, but the week after. Okay, so we'll you will have time to finish the implementation of the API, but also to focus on the topics of today's lectures on, on application security. Okay, so uh, uh, it's the task of the API to prevent requests from doing actions that the client is not authorized or not supposed to do. Okay, so in general it means accessing data. So uh, if the client is not authorized to see the, this data, we shouldn't send it back. Or modify the data or delete the data or insert the data and so on. Okay, insert new data and so on. Okay, there's the issue of the rate of request uh, because, you know, uh, performing actions uh, is always, uh, uh, you know, a, a task that requires uh, uh, computational resources that runs on the CPU, right? So uh, you need to query the database, etc. And as I told you before, anybody can send requests. And if they send too many requests, Basically, you encounter what is called uh, in the, in the cybersecurity context the denial of service attacks, right? Sometimes you see D, DOS, and distributed denial of service, so coming from many different places, not just one place to your server, okay? Uh, and this uh, cannot be solved by your application. So in a certain way, this is a good uh, news for this course. We cannot really do anything about this. Okay, it needs to be handled externally because you need a lot of bandwidth and you need a, a system that filters the requests that arrive to your application. Okay, and this is the topic for other courses actually. Uh, they are just uh, this is just a pointer of the fact that you are typically, I mean, we play with a a, a, s a single server. Uh, in a context where a number of requests is limited and so on, but in a real application, you will now have you know your server directly facing the internet, so exposing the server directly to requests coming from any place uh, in the network, and uh, at any rate, you will put some some software before your server that filter your requests and uh, you know uh, handle. Uh, as much as possible this kind of problems okay um, okay um, don't forget that apis in the architecture that we saw for um, a single page application are basically the place where you extract data the data of your application from the server okay so it's the place where you work with data the data of your application so you might want to log some operations, okay? And this is the right place to do, okay? Uh, so you already saw this uh, very simple middleware that was, um, what was the name? Uh, oh, I forgot the name. The middleware that the prince each request um, starts with them, but I forgot it. What's the name? Morgan. Okay, thank you, thank you. So you're, you're awake. Okay. Uh, so this Morgan is very simple. I mean, it just logs on the console, but you might want to log more complex stuff and so on. And, you know, the middleware is there to help you. Okay. Typically, all web servers, regardless of the question of the APIs, but if you take, uh, you know, very common uh, web server software, Apache, Nginx, uh, or whatever, uh, uh, IIS, and so on, they have an option to uh, at least uh, uh, log basic information of each request, okay? Which was the URL that was requested, which was the IP that was in the um, 
uh, source address of the request and so on this kind of basic stuff and then it may be, you might want to monitor apis in a in a deeper way if they are more critical maybe okay typically you know if you are implementing the web server of a bank system a banking system typically you might want uh, to log a lot of the stuff okay in case anything goes wrong okay if you're just playing with the posts of your home page there's no need to monitor that much or to log that much but this depends on what you want to do okay um okay just remember that request to the api so to your web server can arrive at any time this is by definition because we say that it's a distributed application so we don't know when requests arrive can arrive from any place at any time okay and also web applications are multi-user by definition it means that we have one server logical server at least can be implemented on different machines and so on we will not see this stuff but uh, that's it. one single logical web server like there's one single logical database where you put the data you store the data permanently but you have many clients interacting with the same web application think of any web application you're using you know your your google mail your email web-based email any kind and not just google whatever uh, the 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 polytechnical web portal when you go there and check uh, you know your courses and all the stuff you're not alone doing this kind of things that's always the same server with a set of apis and so on and you have your client asking things to this web server but you're not alone and there are many other um, uh, users like you asking uh, asking things uh, potentially at the same time okay um, it's not just a, a matter of uh, 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 it's not just a matter of users I mean requests can come also uh, if they are not authenticated I mean you go to the wwwpolito uh, address and you don't need to be authenticated just just a request and as you did anybody can do it okay or you go to the didattica politity web page uh, uh, probably you cannot do that no you can you can browse uh, like the the list of the courses in the study plans uh, and so on these are just requests from your uh, mm, client that don't need to be authenticated so you you are not a specific user identified in a certain way and this request can come concurrently okay from many different clients so let's call them clients not users so we don't mess with the idea of users okay uh, so what's the problem the problem is that uh, if we work on the same shared resource uh, that could be a problem okay you know that uh, anybody can read at any time but only one one can write um, uh, um, at a time okay uh, so, sorry so, uh, uh, he will understand the boss will understand I'm uh, lecturing okay um, so um, typical example is reservations okay uh, of any kind I mean we don't really care okay that doesn't mean uh, uh, authenticated users necessarily so that you can register for something without uh, you know even providing uh, uh, I mean even logging in and so on but let's say you have um, a fixed number of places okay uh, available uh, in a room like this and you would like to implement a booking system okay and if two client asks for ask for the same place how do you handle this uh, situation you need to have a, a, a policy a way to handle this situation okay I, I don't want to give a solution there's no solution it depends on the application first come first served uh, 
uh, I don't know, the, the one with the highest priority will win, uh, will take the seat or will reject both of the requests and you know, will say retry again and hopefully they will not come together uh, and one will come before the other. I, we don't really care about the policy. We just need to be aware of the fact that uh, requests can be concurrent and can be uh, requests that, that would like to uh, perform actions in our data, in our database. Uh, that means writing some information that will make subs uh, subsequent requests uh, answer in a different way. Okay? So, we need to think about this, okay? So it's not just uh, me using the web application, uh, it's just a different form of application uh, that is split into two parts. There's a client and there's a server, okay? That's a very simple way of uh, seeing a web application. It's the way in which typically we test the application because it's easier, because if you have two, three, four people testing the same thing at the same time, you don't understand anything anymore. But you need to write an application that can be used concurrently by many clients, many users, and so on. Okay? Um, so always think in terms of multiple users, multiple clients, concurrent requests. Okay? So in short, means th this uh, requirement means you should have no global variables, no global state in the server to handle client requests. And I, I put this here, I hope you see it here, because it's incredible, but you know, sometimes, let's say one, one, one student for per year, I think, uh, we, we, f we find one student per year that you know, submit the project, and we have a look at the code, and we discover a, like a global variable in the server. What is this global variable supposed to do? Uh, just to store the information that comes from the user. But this is nonsense. This is a, a, a web application can be used by many clients at the, tem at the same time. So if two clients arrive, uh, and there's just one place to where, you where you write your information, what are you supposed to do when the second arrives? It overrides the first one? I mean, this is not just a, a, an application that is used by a single client at a time, okay? This could be an option for some application, I don't know. But this is not the way, this is not the thing we're focusing on, okay? We are focusing on normal, traditional web applications that are used by many, potentially by many clients at a time, okay? So this is really, really important. But I mean, this is a really weird idea. I mean, if I, I, you will never see something like this uh, in good code, okay? So just uh, because I've seen this uh, stuff, uh, you know, uh, in, during the exams and, and uh, I would like to underline that this is really not, not acceptable, okay? Because it means you, you didn't grab the, the very basic concept of web application. They're a distributed application that can have many clients working at the same time on the same data, okay? No assumptions on the order of arrival for or the API request. That's a, the, the same issue, okay? So, you know, uh, many clients doing requests. Who is arriving first, uh, you know, for the reservation example, for instance, okay? Um, you know, it doesn't, uh, you need, we need to work without this kind of assumptions, okay? We, uh, we will implement some code, so, you know, depending on the timing, somebody will get uh, a positive answer, somebody will get a negative answer, and so on. We will handle the situation, but the important thing is that we don't make assumptions. We don't need to write the code in terms of, well, I've seen request number one, so now I expect request number two. Because another request number one can arrive, this request number two can, might not arrive, and so on, okay? Something may happen between the two requests. If it was a, an operation that uh, uh, was split into two, that's wrong. Because, you know, if something happens in the middle, what I'm going to answer to the 
the client. Okay, we will see examples. Okay. Um, okay, and last note uh, also uh, remember that uh, um, you know how the backend is implemented is um, okay. The, the parenthesis should closing here okay is independent from how the client is developed so client and server can use different technologies okay for the purpose of this course just for convenience for our convenience since we learned uh, JavaScript uh, there's Node.js that works very well there's Express that works very well so just you know in one lecture or two we are able you know to to produce a, uh, a reasonably good uh, API server and we use this technology but you know API technology can be um, and web server technology can be anything can be any language can be any framework typically there are frameworks much more complex than Express that helps in developing you know web servers uh, systems uh, that provides APIs okay there are systems to automatically design APIs there are systems that provide persistence automatically and so on okay we, we are keeping the server part very simple, otherwise we will have uh, a, a 12 uh, credit course, okay? But, and we are focusing on the client part. So we are, we are discussing the server part, uh, uh, you know, focusing on security, but only, you know, uh, seeing the basic things that uh, are needed to make our web application work, the client part especially, okay? So uh, you cannot just say, well, the server is written in, uh, in JavaScript with Node.js, so it's basically uh, single-threaded, uh, uh, and uh, these things cannot happen. Okay, that's true for your web server, but if you take these APIs and you change the, the, the server technology, you would like to use a different language, a different framework, and so on, having the same exact API, the same signature, etc. And without touching the client, no, the server can change the behavior. So you need to design APIs that works in any case, okay? No, no, they are not bounded to the fact that we are using Node.js and so on, okay? If there is something specific for Node.js uh, or for what we are using here in the course, we will underline and point out it uh, uh, many times, okay? Because some simplification are needed, you know, to keep the, the, the course simple, as I told you. Okay, so let's see. Uh, formal data correctness. So we'll go into a bit more details now. And then we will uh, um, uh, make an example in the second part of the lecture. So uh, how do we know if data is formally correct? You remember before I said the ID is a positive integer. Okay, who decided that is a positive integer? Well, actually, it's who designed the APIs, which typically in this simple application is uh, it just uh, us. We decided, you know, to make a certain API for the project of the exam. You will decide how to implement your APIs, and this is a subject to evaluation. Okay, so this is actually the first thing that we are going to have a look at uh, at uh, the oral exam. Okay, when we are you are discussing the project because. From the APIs, you get a lot of insight on how the application works. Okay, so that's the first thing I will read and my colleague will read when we are evaluating the project. Because we, we get an idea of what you did. Okay, and with these APIs, so the API specification determine what is acceptable and expected and what is not. Okay, so like as I said before, it's a counter, it's a number of items in your basket that you would like to buy. I mean, it cannot be a negative number, right? It cannot be zero probably, depending on who, how you want to handle the, the API, but you know, zero means you d don't want to buy. So typically the quantity should be one or more and an integer number, okay? Unless you're buying something that can be split like a liquid or something, you know, you, you buy an, an integer number of objects. Exam code, well, maybe somebody already decided this for you. Like uh, identifi uh, identifiers, uh, uh, like, you know, exam codes, uh, the Polytechnic exam codes are strings which are, uh, have a specific format and so on. You just need to follow the specification and so on. Like a zip code, 
uh, the Italian version is uh, five uh, characters, which are five numbers. Okay. You go to UK, they have a num uh, um, they have both numbers and letters. Okay. And there's a different number of uh, uh, characters and so on. Uh, you would like to have an email. That's a specification on how an email is uh, supposed to uh, be formed and so on. Okay? I must say that this is quite tedious to implement and also this is why mm, a lot of middlewares exist uh, to speed up this operation. Uh, we have, uh, for instance, this Express validator, which is very well integrated uh, with Express. Okay, so it means that basically it's a, a middleware that you can just insert here in the list uh, of uh, the parameters that you pass to the method that you would like to handle in Express. You know, get, that's the URL, and there's a number of parameters that you can put before the callback that actually handles the request. And here, if you install this Express validator, you can perform checks uh, on the parameters that you receive in the request. Of course, the static uh, stuff uh, doesn't need to be checked. Of course, uh, the first part of the rule will be slash user, because otherwise you won't be called here. I mean, the callback here, rec, res, and so on, will not be called, because Express will not match the first part of the rule URL and will go in another callback if present, okay? It happened to you in the lab yesterday, right? You mistype something in the URL and it says uh, 404 not found, okay? So the, the static part, the fixed part doesn't need to be checked, but the variable part must be checked, okay? And there are convenient methods to, to do this uh, check, okay? This, oops, this check function is provided by this uh, express validator and looks uh, for all the variable parameters that comes in the request. So it means in rec body, rec params, rec query, okay, Th those three. And uh, you have a lot of validators that can help you to check if the content is formally correct. I mean, this is a, the, the, these are a, a couple of the most common ones. Uh, is an email, is uh, the length is at least a certain number, a maximum number uh, of characters, and so on. You just need to click here. Uh, okay, that's really nice. Okay, let's hope uh, it works. Okay. I'm authenticated on GitHub. But this doesn't really require authentication. Okay. There are a lot of validators uh, that you can use uh, in this library. Okay. Uh, Ma many, many things, okay? Like email, etc. Okay. Uh, how you check for errors? Uh, you just need to, let's say, copy and paste this code. I mean, that's this function validation result that you can, can use if you use this express validator. It gives you a list of errors, okay? But I give you an example ready to use, okay? You just need to modify it. What to do when you get an error? Well, you need to decide how your API behaves, okay? So it will not return uh, to 200, so everything is okay because there has been an error. Um, you can return a, a code in the range of 400 something, which is typically the error. This is just an option, 422 is typically the formal, uh, formal error or something like this, okay? But any outside the range of 200 is fine, okay? Because in the range of 200 means uh, the, the request had no problem and was in some way executed. Okay, so some tips. Yes, there's a question, right? Yes, yes, so. The first parameter is always the URL. The last parameter is always the callback in which you execute the code, and everything in the middle is middleware, okay? So there could be also more than one, okay? And uh, let's say Express is, uh, uh, is checking 
the type of the parameters that you pass in the middle. And if it is an array, uh, it is ready to, to check what's inside the array. And if it determines that it is a validator, it will run the validator. Okay? If it's a middle that you define, so if it's a function, it just executes the function and so on. Okay? So it's all, everything is embedded into Express. Okay? So Express is quite flexible in this way and uh, in this context, and that's why we use Express and not the internal HTTP web server of a node, which is much less flexible. Okay, some tips. I need to speed up a little bit, but not that much. Uh, well, pre please avoid writing your validators for non-trivial data, okay? Of course, if you just need to check the length I mean, probably dot length is fine, <laughs> okay? But if you need to check, like uh, before, an email. An email is not really a trivial thing to check because valid emails are specified in a standard and can take many, many different forms. It's not just checking there's a, a an hat symbol, at symbol, you know, this, this symbol in, in the string. Okay, the, the, this is one possibility, but uh, I mean, th this doesn't mean it's a valid email because you should have a, a, a domain on the right. And you know, nowadays there exists a lot of top level domains and stuff. And on the left part, you can have special symbols, even quotes and so on. You just, uh, you know, have a look at, at the website just, just to make you think, I mean, Writing a validator for non-trivial stuff is not that easy, okay? So if you find some good library that uh, uh, do it for you, just use it, okay? Check it uh, if it's uh, fine and works well and use it, okay? You might be tempted to use this regexp, means regular expression. You know, you can specify, I want a character, one or more, followed by an at sign, followed by something, followed by a dot, and so on. But that's not really catching every email, for instance, okay? Or every other, you know, type of, uh, uh, type of uh, data that you would like to, to check. Like uh, checking dates. I mean, not that trivial. Okay, because uh, you would like to, there can be many formats first, and then you know the year, the the month, the day, and you know the, there are no months with 32 days. That's fine, but when when is uh, 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 when the month has 29 days and so on, and you know you have time as well. Maybe you have time zones. You have uh, all all the stuff. Okay, and so. Try not to, you know, um, uh, write validators if it's not really something extremely simple. Okay, like you know the 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 course code of the Polytechnic. Yeah, that's fine. Probably you can write your validator. I mean, there are two numbers, three letters, and plus two additional letters depending on on the on the uh, course of study. Okay. In that case, probably you can write your validator also because probably you won't find a validator ready for you. Okay, but this is more complex type of data and typically more complex types of data are used not just by you. Maybe somebody has, has written a good validator and please use it. Okay. Okay, so formal validation, we solved it in some way. Okay, so if it's really trivial, you just use uh, uh, um, uh, your validator. So it's a NIF that checks, uh, let's say, the number is positive, fine. Okay. If it's not trivial, please have a look at libraries uh, that do the check for you because it's not trivial to implement. Data consistency, that's more difficult, okay? Because we need to avoid an inconsistent database state. That's the main problem, okay? So let's uh, see an example. Let's say I would like to add a comment on the collection comments. And uh, uh, I would like to add the, the comment on the post, post ID. Okay, one, two, three, four. 
the comment is not the post. It's something that you add, you attach to a post. Okay, there are many comments for each single post. And you would like to write something, fine, a great post. Okay, so of course you, you just need to run an insert in the database, no problem. I mean, not really a big deal. But as I was saying before, if the post ID doesn't exist, what are you going to do? Well, first of all, you need to realize that this ID doesn't exist. Okay? If you otherwise you end up with a database with an inconsistent state. So you have a comment which is not attached to any post. Okay? Uh, they can these problems can start to build up uh, and maybe create uh, some issues in the way that your application works at a certain time. Okay? Uh, in any case, it's it, it just a, an error from the logical uh, point of view of the application. Okay, so how can we handle this situation? Well, you can both use uh, code or, or uh, in simple cases, the database. Okay, so in the code, well, you have if uh, and all these uh, control structures. Okay, so uh, you first check in the database if the ID exists and then you proceed with the insert, otherwise you return an error. Okay? Um, so you do a select and then an insert. Or maybe you would like to have a, a database that maintains this uh, integrity with some constraints. Actually, that's a possibility. Uh, I, I would like to mention it here for completeness, but remember we are not in the course uh, of you know database design okay so um, if you take some constraint and you implement outside your application you first need to document it very well because uh, you know who is maintaining or working on your application maybe don't doesn't know that uh, you implement something in the in the database system so you put a foreign key constraint in the database system, for instance, okay? So that the insert, if the foreign key doesn't exist, will fail. That's a problem of the database and the database will fail the insert. But this is a logic, a part of the logic of your application that has been implemented outside your application in the database system. It's not forbidden, it's just you know, a complication, an additional complication, you need to think if it, this is the best way to proceed. Also, considering what are you going to do with the application, who is maintaining the application, who is documenting the application, etc. Okay? If you have something outside your application, of course, uh, things get uh, quite uh, uh, quickly difficult to debug. Okay? Why this query fails? I need to log the query. I need to run the query separately on the database and see why it fails and so on. Okay? While if there's some problem in your code, you're probably just debugging your code and you're developing your code and it's easier. Okay? Just uh, some advice. Okay? So another example, you cannot insert more than a certain number of items in a certain uh, place, let's say a shopping cart. Um, you know, th that's exactly the same as before. Okay. What I would like to uh, highlight here is that if you have additional constraint, not just the foreign key constraint, which is a typical constraint in application, because you have uh, many tables which are related basically by the ID, but you have a, a an application level constraint. I mean. Uh, for some reason, you decided that people cannot uh, buy more than 10 things uh, at a time, okay, 10 items at a time. Well, you need to check this uh, condition, but make sure to check it before performing the requested operation on the database, okay? So don't add the stuff before you check the, that the stuff can actually be added, okay? This seems trivial again, but this, again, it's a source of problems because uh, then if you did a, a, a modification in the database which was not supposed to be done, you need to roll back the, the modification, right? And rolling back stuff is always difficult, okay? Either you have transaction that you actually will tell you, well, we don't want to use it because, you know, school i3 doesn't support them so well, okay? And so please check it, 
check uh, your conditions before inserting stuff, before modifying the database, okay? Um, you can also, let's say, do some tricks like you see here the SQL. Some of your colleagues in the past years were very, let's say, um, how to say, um, a lot, they had a lot of fantasy, you know, in writing uh, SQL queries. You can make queries uh, like multi multi row queries and so on to try to implement everything in a single query. So either it gets executed or everything is rejected by the database. Okay, so it doesn't, you don't insert anything and so on. But I mean, this approach is not scalable. Okay, because you cannot really express all the constraints that you can mm, have in your application through SQL language. Okay, through complex SQL language as well. Okay. So this just to give you an idea, this performs the insert only if the where condition is true and, uh, you know, if the count is uh, uh, constraint is not satisfied, that means the where constraint is not true and the query doesn't get executed. But it's quite convoluted way of approaching the problem, I would say. Okay. Okay, let's come to the SQL injection. Okay. Um, well, nowadays, uh, this doesn't happen so often because uh, everybody knows about this problem since 10, 20 years, okay? Uh, and I already gave, uh, give you a way to avoid it, okay? And very simple way, it's just to use the parametri parametrized queries, okay? So use the question mark where you need to insert values because values are the stuff that comes from outside the application. So that's the uh, risky part of the query because there you can have uh, data that can cause problems, okay? So let's say we would like to add a user whose name is John, uh, semicolon drop table users, okay? You, uh, you understand what happens if we run a query where we construct the query just concatenating strings. So we, we are issuing two commands at the database, okay? So insert, etc. And the first insert will get executed, but then the second statement will get executed as well. And drop table means uh, just delete the table, okay? I hope you have a backup, right? <laughs> so that's why you should do backups. Uh, I mean, this, this example will not really work uh, in SQLi3 and all the stuff we have, but I have another example to show you in the end, just to show you that, uh, you know, SQL injection is always uh, possible in some ways, okay? Um, so how to prevent it? Well, this is probably one of the, the simplest thing to do, because if you use parameterized queries, so it means the queries with the question mark, that basically are available from any um, database system, not just SQLite 3, but any kind of uh, database uh, system, uh, you avoid the problem completely because the, the database takes uh, this uh, data and treats it separately from commands. So it will never execute stuff that is contained in data that is supposed to be used in insert, delete, update operations. Okay? So it's uh, very risky, but very simple to avoid. So, you know. Just use this stuff. If you are in doubt, just uh, ask us uh, during the labs and so on, okay? Queries are not always uh, easy like this. I mean, if you are searching for stuff, you need uh, to pass in some ways, also in select, for instance, some strings coming from, from the user, right? And the user can search for anything, right? So, um, I mean, not always easy, but uh, they are always a, a way to, to avoid this SQL injection. Okay. There is no just uh, injection because you run commands in the database. You can just inject stuff that gets uh, replied to you, so uh, sent back to, to the client and executed by the browser. So let's say the, the name of the user is John, script, etc. Script is the HTML tag that you will see in, uh, after uh, Easter that says uh, the following is a JavaScript uh, instruction, okay? It's JavaScript code that needs to be executed by the browser. 
here we just put alert act, so it opens a small window with the, the, the string act, but it can do anything. It can access local storage, it can read the stuff in your application and send it back to, to some servers around the world, okay, without you knowing anything, okay? So, uh, we will come back to this, but just to show you that we really, really need to be careful when we are, we are taking stuff from outside and use it for um, um, uh, to, to insert this data uh, in, in the database, okay? Uh, I will come back to this example because there's a whole set of slides on this kind of problems, okay? Because there are other, it's another class of problems, not just uh, like SQL injection. It, it takes them more time to, to discuss. Okay, uh, so this is what happens, uh, you know, you insert the content, that's the name, no problem. The problem happens when you load the name because you would like to show a page showing the name of the users, okay? And in that page, the script will get executed on the client and you will get, uh, you know, something like this, okay? The, so the, the, in this case, the window, but as I told you, it could be a script that uploads data to something else, so to somewhere in the network. Uh, typically, somebody who ha has no good intentions <laughs> with your data. Again, many frameworks, including React, uh, prevent the execution of the code like this. Uh, but we need to focus a little bit more on this problem, okay? Because it, it cannot prevent really everything, okay? It depends on what you are doing with your application. Yeah, basic stuff like this, it's easy to intercept and to uh, handle, but uh, there are more complex cases where we need to uh, pay attention. Okay, security and permission. Well, uh, the point is here. Did they check if the requester has the permission to do the operation? This is really, really important. This is a major source of errors in the, in the projects. Well, actually in last year, so we didn't focus that much on security. Yeah, we have two additional credits on security, so I hope you get it right. Uh, we need to have a way to check who is, uh, uh, check who is requesting the operation and we don't have a mean to do this uh, at the moment, but uh, as I told you in the last part of the course, we will focus a lot on, uh, on these cases, okay? And if you have a user, you always need to check if the, um, I mean, to, to retrieve the user from a source which is reliable. You cannot just take uh, the user ID, the username, or whatever from the request. That's a big error, okay? Because if you take it from the request, it's like uh, you go to the bank, you say, I'm the owner of the account, please give me the money, okay? If they don't check if you are actually the owner of the, uh, the, the bank account, they will give money to anybody, right? But you, they cannot just trust you because you are the one who, are make, who is making the request. You cannot be trusted. There should be another way of trusting you, okay? For instance, they have your ID stored and they check your ID and you have your ID and so on. You have your face or you have a token if it's remote, you know, with the bank and so on, okay? Okay, so we will come back to this point when, it, when it's time in the course. Synchronization issues. Web application are multi-user concurrent by definition. And the backend implementation, so the web server, runs independently of what the client is doing. And you're not the only client, potentially, okay? So you need to pay a lot of attention to all actions that may change their output due, due to the potential interference from other actions started either by you or by others, okay? Like, uh, take this example, just to have ideas, okay, about these problems. You bid in an auction. You know what an auction is, right? You offer a price, 
you know, to buy something and somebody else has the option to offer more and so on. At a certain time, they stop it uh, and uh, the one who offered the more uh, gets the, the object, right, the, the item. Okay, so let's say you would like to, uh, to implement this stuff in, a, in an application, okay, uh, in a web application. And so you would like to offer something. First, you need to know which is the current offer, right? Okay. Uh, <coughs> so get the best offer. Okay, that's fine. Uh, now it's 100, 100, whatever, dollars, euros, whatever. And then put, you remember, put is uh, for updating. Let's update the best offer. I've seen it's 100, I, I will update it to 105, okay? This is wrong, okay? First part is fine, I just, you know, asking what's the current price, no problem. What's wrong? And the, the, uh, the second part is wrong. Because if in the middle, let's say a colleague of you offered the 110, where's the 110? If and then I override the offer with 105, okay? That's a, a wrong behavior, okay? So what if another client do something similar that interfere with your operations, okay? Race conditions may happen yielding a wrong behavior, okay? Race condition means uh, things that happen depending on the order of the actions, okay? And the order is not fixed because they are asynchronous actions. They are initiated by the client and the client can initiate at any time, okay? So how we fix this uh, this problem? You see the big X means, uh, please don't copy this example, okay? So you design a single API that implements the request operation in a single HTTP transaction. So a single request response transaction ending with either success or failure. So what was wrong before? I was using put assuming that nothing was changed between the get and the put, okay? So if we say, okay, we post a new offer uh, and the new offer is 105, it's the server's task to decide if the offer uh, uh, needs to be accepted or not. So you're not saying the server, just overwrite the new best price with 105. This is the price I offer. Please tell me if you, everything is fine or not. Okay? If it's fine, it will reply, okay, accepted, and the new best offer is 105. But also it may happen that in the middle, in the meanwhile, somebody else has offered something more, and so your request is rejected in some ways, and here is the new best offer. That's a possible implementation. You don't have to reply with the best offer, okay? You don't even have to reply with an error code. That's not potentially an HTTP error. It's just the way the, your application works. It's up to your client to decide what to do with the information that your, your offer has been accepted or rejected. Yes. You show it uh, green or, or, or red, but it's not an HTTP error. It's not like we didn't find a resource on the server and so on. Okay, the client uh, does not, doesn't know and should not know how the server implements the function, okay? This is really important. This is another uh, source of uh, errors uh, at the exams. So failing to recognize which action should be implemented as a single API, okay? Because if you implement it with separate APIs, like get and then update, that's a typical wrong pattern, get and update. Somebody in the middle may insert uh, operations that makes your uh, update not valid anymore, okay? And this happens a lot. Um, yeah, you see the examples here. Like every counter has this problem. You would like to add a, a like or, or a reaction or whatever to your messages. If you don't want to lose any update, so any plus one or like and so on, you cannot just read the number and update the number plus one, okay? 
the server needs to do this because only the server knows what's the current status and can make sure that all updates are counted. The reservation again, that's a similar problem. You cannot just read which seat is empty and just say, this is mine. Now, this is yours just if the server says it's yours. If the server, uh, let's say, read the, the fact that the, uh, the place was free and then in the same transaction as the allocated the, se the seat to you. Okay? So that's yours. Otherwise, you cannot just say, that's mine. Okay? Because you risk to overwrite something that is not yours anymore. Okay? Or like uh, buying items. Okay? There's just one item left. So you cannot just say, okay, I buy this stuff because I've seen that this is, this is available. I'm not sure if it's still available when I say I would like to buy it. Okay? Note that these are all post transactions. Why they are post transaction or, or HTTP methods? Okay? because they modify the status on the server. While the put before, if you look at the put, the put, if you put again 105 and 105 and 105, the status on the server is always 105. So that's an indication that, that this is wrong, okay, as a behavior. Because when, when you offer something, you should modify the current offer potentially uh, if it gets rejected it will not modify it but potentially it modifies the status on the server okay so how do you update it okay and then i think yes we, we have more or less finished and we will break for lunch for your lunch so actually this is uh, one of the most difficult things to to to, mm, to, to get it right uh, just in this course, since we decided to use the Node.js, which by the way serializes the operations, uh, the operation can be implemented like this, either with a single SQL query. A single SQL query is always safe because a single SQL query is always a single transaction by definition. So the database either executes it fully or not. Okay. Or if you would like to use code, especially if the logic is complex, not just a typical update uh, plus one. Okay, plus one is very easy to implement, it's not that difficult, I mean, uh, or max or whatever, I mean, simple operation. But if there's a complex logic to decide if I, I can allocate, I can reserve these seats for you because you would like to have three seats which are close together, but the fourth in the back and so on, uh, and there's a different price, I need to check the price if it corresponds to the price you paid and so on. So it's complex logic. You cannot really implement everything into a single query, right? So what do you do? Well, you write code and, you're, and you run many queries. But you need to be careful that in, in a, let's say, a, in a standard web application uh, on the server side, if you would like that nobody interferes with your queries, you should put all these queries into a single SQL transaction, right? So you block the resources on which you would like to work. So actually you should have a select, etc. for update. Update what you would like to have to update, okay? In the meanwhile, you are sure that nobody is modifying stuff, okay? And then close the transaction. If the transaction closed successfully, nobody has modified anything and you're free to, to, to you know, return your result and that's correct. And if the transaction doesn't close for some reasons, you know that databases roll back any modifications you attempted to do. So you, you are back to a status which is consistent for your application, okay? So in short, to handle cases like this, we should have transactions, okay? Database transactions, okay? Only for this course, you see the green box. Only for this course, only for simplicity, uh, SQL queries executed in the code of the same API, so in the same 
the code of the, of the callback, all the queries are executed in the same callback of a certain API, will be assumed to be executed sequentially without any external interference as if it was an actual transaction of the database. Okay? Why we are saying this? Well, first to make things a bit simpler for your exam. Okay? Because if you add transactions, well, first of all, the, the database library should support it very well, which is not actually the case for SQLi3 because it's actually a file, it's not really a database server. Right? And uh, also, when you have transactions, uh, you need to do uh, many things. So uh, uh, you need to handle the cases in which the transactions rolls back. You need to wait for the end of the transaction. If a transaction doesn't close, you need to roll back it manually and so on. So there are many things that you need to do. And actually, this we believe this is a, a bit too much for our course, okay? If you're using a serious database server, actually you start before the first attack, you start with begin transaction, you do all the operation and commit, but then it's not just committing. Is be, uh, after the commit, you need to end the status of the transaction. If it is being committed, a rollback of maybe it, it gave a timeout, and so you need to wait, and so other uh, APIs working on that data, you know, you need to end the fact that it can be called in the mean, in the meanwhile and so on. Okay, so just for this course, just for simplicity because this is not uh, the actual focus of the course, we focus more on the client part than on the server part, we will assume that SQL queries executed in the code of the same API, same API, so just one API, are executed uh, without interference from the external, uh, from external um, requests, okay? So, in short, if you have a single HTTP request, everything is fine. If you have two, like here, you cannot implement this kind of behavior because any HTTP request is independent of the other request. Okay? So you cannot close the transaction after the second, after the put and open it in the get because you don't know, you don't even know if the client will call it your put. You don't even know if the network will work for, to allow the client to make the request, the put request, okay? So this is really wrong as a behavior of designing. Uh, designing APIs like this is really bad and will, you know, uh, get away points from, from the mark of your exam, okay? Will not really fail everything, but I mean, for sure, uh, uh, it will get away points, okay? So, uh, here we, we have discussed a lot of things for the APIs and in the second hour and a half we'll try to apply to our example and then in the next lab you'll try to apply all this concept in, your, uh, uh, um, in the development of your uh, lab for, so for the film library. Here you find a lot of uh, references, okay? So you see input validation. It's not just as simple as I told you. More or less, this, there are the basic concepts, but if you go and click, uh, you see that's a page, uh, you know, quite long page, okay? It will also tell you something about, uh, uh, something more like a, about regular expressions, about, uh, you know, what to do, what not, not to do, and so on. Also, we didn't talk about, you know, file uploads. We will not probably use file uploads in our application. Just, be, just because of simplicity. I mean, we cannot just solve uh, everything here, okay? But you should have a place where to look in case you, you need to face these problems. Like, uh, there's a file upload, okay? Uh, do I trust the file type extension? What is sent by the client? Where do I put the file? All these kind of problems, okay? You need to reflect about this. Okay, so they are just, uh, you know, uh, links. As you see, I, I took them from the uh, WASP website, eh, which is a really, really good reference. And in case uh, you are in doubt, just check this uh, website and at least it will give you pointers to go into more details about the problems that you have attained. Okay? So I would break now for lunch, for your lunch. I'm 
waiting here. Let's say 10, 15 minutes break. In the meanwhile, I prepare the example and uh, uh, in the next hour and a half, we'll, we'll code a little bit with this concept in mind. Okay, no questions, so let's break here.